Alrighty, peoples, this is Ross. Welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. I do appreciate you guys being here with me tonight. Uh, this is the podcast style video that I do for you guys Wednesday nights, 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and then also how to grow it. And that's what we're going to really focus on today is uh, getting ready for this upcoming season. As I'm sure a lot of you guys are aware, the season is fast approaching, and I think a lot of people sort of neglect this time of the of the year. Although there's nothing going on outside, it's very cold. In fact, tonight it's supposed to be extremely windy. You guys might even be able to hear it at times. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it really is the time to get everything organized and going. Um, to prepare for the season. A lot of the, the stuff that you guys might see, let's say in my summer, as you can see here, this is a photo of uh, the garden in the spring. And then also you may, well, I thought I had a photo here, but I guess not. But also in the, in the summer for sure, when everything's crazy and there's all this green, it's all lush and it's beautiful and it's, you know, really awesome. Uh, people, like to tune in then and think about this kind of thing then when it's too late. So, you know, as an example, my onions should have started them last month. Um, you know, they really need about two months of, of seed starting to get them to a large size to then be able to plant them out roughly around March 1st here in my climate. Um, they're incredibly hardy. So um, I'm already in a sense behind in certain things. And it's just going to have to be what it is, you know. Um, believe it or not, haven't been able to get much seed. So there's a, a shortage. There's a lot of companies that are struggling to just get their orders fulfilled. There's a lot of demand. Um, also, people are struggling with the virus. So there's different circumstances. And it's just quite difficult. So the more you plan, the, the better you, you do this ahead of time the better off you're going to be. Um, and not only that, but I think it's important just to know what goes in this whole process. You know, three months before my my average last frost. So that's what we're going to talk about in today's episode is, you know, what what is it that I'm doing three months in advance? All the things we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to really have a huge range of topics. At the end, we're going to talk a lot about my plans for my garden because there's a lot of new varieties, a lot of new vegetables I've never grown before. I think this is a really great episode because this to me is a super exciting. Um, I found a number of different vegetables that uh, probably a lot of us have never even heard of or tried. So, I think it's really awesome to be able to try these things and see for ourselves how well they do. I just would highly recommend you guys stick it out to the end because we're going to talk about some really these Italian varieties of vegetables that uh, are quite popular in Italy, but I really had no idea about them. And I think uh, you guys will be quite um, interested to hear what they are so that you can grow them yourself. Uh, we're going to talk about things like propagation. So we're going to talk about some grafting that I'll do. Uh, we're going to do some, uh, obviously, some seed starting, how that's all going to work. And then our rooting process, how that's coming along. Um, we're going to talk about planting because I also have not only, uh, you know, vegetables and annuals to plant, but what about our fruit trees? We did actually decide on a couple things that we are going to plant this year against sort of really what I should be doing because I don't think I'm going to be here at this property for too much longer, but um, I am going to be planting things. I am going to be uh, getting things at least in containers. Uh, we're adding a number of citrus trees that we've talked about in prior episodes. So there's a lot to cover in this episode and I don't even know if we're going to get it all in, but we're going to try. And uh, let's see here. So we could, we're going to start off, I think, with actually just that is our citrus trees that we've decided to go with. And also really an update to that, but, but also why is it that I've sort of been 
thinking about not planting anything this year because I went on One Green World's website as an example. Other mail order nurseries uh, go on their websites and you see all these interesting plants and all these interesting varieties of things I want to grow. I mean, there's so many things that I've just sort of just said to myself, enough is enough because I don't, I'm not going to be here forever at this property. But also, you know, I'm running out of space. I've definitely ran out of space at this point. Um, so n planting things doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I almost convinced myself to plant quite a few things around the edge, actually, of the summer garden. I was planning on, see these, like, this piece of wood here? Well, it goes all the way around and creates a, a raised bed. It's obviously not very high, and it just kind of borders. It really is mainly there for a border from the grass to the, uh, to the soil. So what I thought about doing was building a kind of a gar like a, like a, uh, almost a fence on the edges of the garden all the way around, maybe not all the way on this side where the figs are, but in this front area here, uh, that faces South. And then this area here, which faces North, I'm sorry, which faces, uh, East. And, um, I thought about building like a little bit of a railing that goes up to maybe my hip or maybe slightly higher than that. Uh, maybe, yeah, about up to my hip because what I would do is if I could do that and construct with wood and attach it to the raised bed, it really wouldn't be that difficult. It wouldn't cost that much. And I could very easily plant on the inside of the garden around the edges is I could actually plant some grapevines I could plant some uh, marionberry plants, which I really wanted to do. I love the marionberry, as I discovered last year. It was exceptional. I can't believe how good that berry is. We'll talk about another berry. That actually, I'm going to plant this year in just a minute. Um, it's called the Olympic berry. But I thought it would be a really great idea to do that because it would look beautiful, number one. It wouldn't really take up too much space of the garden. Um it would obviously limit some things, but, uh, you know, you, there's a whole walkway here on this left side that is not really being used. So I kind of figure if, if it's on the edge, maybe it could kind of make more use of that space in the walkway, which I really uh, don't want to grow in. Um, I don't want to be taking up more land or digging up more things or, or planting more trees or whatever it is. So I've been limited, right? I mean, that's really the plan. I think for anyone that doesn't know at this point is that I hope this time next year, I'm going to be looking for a property and hopefully moving into somewhere, um, to live. So, you know, obviously that's the plan. It's probably not going to work out ex exactly like that. Maybe it'll take two years, but I would say the next two years for sure, I, I'm going to be out of this property. So, um, that's exciting. And it's exciting for the future, but I just need to have a little bit of restraint for another year or two of what it is I really decide to uh, to grow. Because I want to go crazy. I want to get like, you know, somewhere around at least I think five acres for me would probably satisfy the the insanity. Um, because there's just so much to plant. You know, I mean, I've barely even scratched the surface of of figs you know there's a whole i could probably plant a whole acre of just figs i mean uh even more than that maybe you know it's it's just kind of crazy uh some of the preservation i would like to do the trialing the continued trialing i would like to do within figs and then there's all these other fruits and vegetables which take up a lot more space and um you know there's a huge genetic diversity within those uh you know, you think about, could even start thinking about some nut trees, which I haven't even ventured into because they take a long time to fruit and, you know, uh, they need, usually need a bit more room than some of the other fruit trees. But even some of the fruit trees they take, they could get up to 40 feet tall and 40 feet wide. So, um, you know, really thinking far ahead here uh, for this property and kind of thinking you know, ahead of like where I what, what where this hobby is going to take me. It's so hard to know because I don't want to buy a property that's only five acres and say, oh, it's only five acres. 
<laughs> you know, but five acres is like a ton of land. So I don't know how I'm going to feel or what I'm going to want, but I guess, I mean, I'd be lucky to get five acres to be honest with you, but, um, I think that's probably where I'm going to end up at and limit myself at because, uh, I should say limit myself at, and maybe not end up at just simply because it's, it's a lot to maintain as well. You know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of thoughts that go into this, and I don't know how I'll feel a year, or two years from now. Maybe when I even see these properties, how my thoughts would change. Uh, it's hard to know. So, I mean, what does even an acre look like? I mean, I've seen my buddy Bass's place, his yard, uh, his property is about is an acre. He told me, so I know what it looks like in terms of that. But what do five of those look like? I don't know. Um, he certainly has a ton of room. And then, of course, how much of that is usable, right? Um, but hopefully five acres of usable land. That would be that'd be something, right? Um, all right, so that's the plans. And then what we have decided to do, though, is I am going to plant a couple things, some perennials. But let's start off with the citrus tree. So the we've talked a lot about citrus on fruit talk so many times um we've even did a i think an episode just on this just on hardy citrus and this guy here mckenzie farms is someone that i've talked about where he has a of you know a nursery of hardy more hardy varieties of citrus and um it's really quite interesting um i personally am growing actually quite a hardy variety of citrus and it's it, although it's a flying dragon seedling, I believe, or a uh, trifoliate. Or no, no, I don't know what it is. I, I forget. I have to look it up. But it's basically a flying dragon. I imagine something similar, hardy like that. But flying dragon doesn't produce a high quality piece of fruit. It's really difficult to use it in any sense in the kitchen. So it's there really just as a rootstock, and people use it as like hedges and. Yeah, it's to be able to say you could grow citrus in the north, right? But there is a seedling of that that I have that's supposed to have a much better quality in the kitchen. So there, there's that. And that's pretty cool. And that tree's doing okay. It's not doing great. But it's coming along from seed. This is its second year that it's been through from seed. So entering its third year, maybe we'll start to see some size. And then maybe next year... If I don't dig it up at that point, it could, I guess, flower uh, potentially. So there, that's pretty cool. But the majority of the citrus here I grow is going to be in pots and is in pots. And we've talked about the citrus in the last couple episodes of Fruit Talk where I ordered some varieties from Four Winds. And, um, you know, those three varieties were the Calamundin because I really appreciate the the kumquat varieties, plus the potential of making a marmalade. By the way, made myself a marmalade. It was made out of Meyer lemons, um, the Eustace lime quat that I grew, and then also some of the Fukushu kumquats I have. And I just added them all together, and it did not come out very good. And I think my issue was all of the many um, peels. The peel did not really break down at all and it was just in a sense a gooey candied awesome flavored citrus peel and I guess I should have probably when I was cutting up the different pieces of citrus is I should have instead of slicing them I should have probably sliced them but some of them took out the peel and discarded the peel and that way I would have had a lot less of the peel in the marmalade but I don't know. I think it it's it has its use. It tastes a lot like lemon. Um, it's pretty darn good, but not something I'm going to go out of my way to eat very often. And I don't really know. <laughs> exa- I mean, I guess I could just use it a, a, like a dessert, a lemony dessert topping, you know, which I think is, is nice. Don't get me wrong, but there's so much of that peel. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. I didn't do it right, but kind of now on the fence a little bit even bought some marmalades from online like different places on amazon and try to get myself a wide variety of them and i 
couldn't find one I actually liked. I got a bitter orange one that I took one bite of and thought there was something wrong with it and spit it out. Um, I got a, a different one that I think uh, actually kind of was messed up in the mail, so I didn't even didn't even try it. So two of them I ended up having to throw out. So maybe I'll have to yeah I'll have to reserve judgment still actually on a good marmalade. But uh, if anyone has a suggestion, let me know about a particular brand. I'd like to try one, and I just can't seem to find a decent one, um, or at least one that arrives in proper condition. Um, so then, you know, that's where the Kalamondin I'm kind of like on the fence about and, and these kumquats, but the Fukushu kumquat is definitely one you can eat fresh. And I really, really like that. I was actually more surprised and more, more, uh, happy with it as it definitely ripened further along on the tree. I haven't been taking great care of those trees, really even been taking great care of the cuttings, uh, that I've been starting, but you know, it, it definitely, I got to see the potential of the kumquat, even in an indoor cold climate like this. Um, so they're really good. Now we also ordered, I think, a, I think it was a bear's lime, if I'm not mistaken. And that's more your traditional lime. And then we also ordered a lemon and, uh, I don't remember the names of these things. I think it was a Eureka or a Lisbon. Pretty sure it's Eureka. I, I there's too many things going on in my mind, guys. But um, point is, is that I think it's really good to have a standard lemon and a standard lime that produce well, perform well. All these citrus trees do great in pots, like the Kalamundin, like these these limes and the lemons here. So seems like a no-brainer. Now, there's a few that I've been thinking about and have, my, have had my eyes on for containers, but also for the potential of planting them in the ground to also doing a further hardiness experiment in the future with hardier types of citrus. And I guess you guys were telling me years ago that I should actually grow yuzu. I recently saw a video, I think it was on Eater, some YouTube video that I thought was super interesting. Of course it was recommended to me, right? And it was about these people actually in northern Jersey, in the Princeton area, that are growing yuzu. And that's not too far away from me. So I figured, well, they can do it, I can do it. They did say in the video they lose about 30% of their trees every winter. But they have them in pots. And I think if you got them to a reasonable size in a pot, and then planted it in the ground, had it in a good location, maybe sheltered it, maybe even just protected it on a couple nights out of the year you could probably have a permanent yuzu tree in the grounds. I don't see why you wouldn't. I mean, um, it's going to be difficult and, uh, you know, it's not going to be like a, a, a breeze or anything, but it's definitely something worth trying to do. And I think it's very, very possible. Uh, the other citrus trees, I actually had two in mind for a container that we mentioned in other videos and I'm trying to find the name here it is so one is the Excalibur lime and the other one's the Amoa 8 blood orange so I'm still waiting from those from one green world to see if I can even get them um, to order them and also have those in pots I really like the Excalibur and lime that seemed really interesting and then if I've been talking about yuzu what about sudachi right it's quite similar it's very hardy just like the yuzu so I feel like Sudachi could work here too, again, given all those special care, careful considerations that I mentioned. The protected location, maybe protecting it on a certain cold night, whatever it is, and, you know, actually having them in the ground. And I thought, well, if it's hardy to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, which I probably think would be about a conservative estimate. I would imagine the Yuzu and the Sudachi probably conservatively will probably survive 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem is when we get down to zero and that really sparks some causes for concern. So I don't know exactly how that's going to work out or what, but um, certainly it's worth a try. And then the other citrus variety is actually called the uh, Thomasville what is it? 
Thomasville Citranquat. So this one is, uh, according to McKenzie Farms here, it's one of the early attempts by citrus researchers to produce a cold-hardy citrus tree with good fruit. Trees can grow 15 feet, very cold-hardy, very prolific bears, and the immature fruits fruits make a great lime substitute. So I've heard mixed reviews. Some people say that the fruit quality is bad. Other people say it's actually pretty good. And it, you can use it as a lime. And then some people even said that when it really gets ripe it turns into like a kumquat and people even like it as a kumquat so i don't know where i'm going to stand with it if it's going to even be useful but it says here hardy to five degrees fahrenheit once established so that's pretty darn awesome um and certainly i would just say that uh that one's worth a shot too right so out of all the you know citrus varieties that i think have a at least a decent or better quality of fruit and they're also hardy uh these are worth in my opinion worth a shot so we're trying to grow them first and foremost in a pot for a couple years which is why it makes sense to get them now before i move and then we can transplant them there at a later date uh when they get to a larger size so i'm looking forward to it and that's of course, one of the things that we're decided to uh, to grow in terms of our perennials and add to our perennial collection. Now, some other things we decided to do, like I mentioned a little bit ago, was the Olympic berry. And this is uh, according to Rain Tree Nursery, and this is just a claim, so who knows, but it says here, once so popular that the Seattle Times called it the most outstanding berry of the Northwest, that this large blackberry family fruit was developed in the 1920s on Vashon Island. Uh, World War II and a death in the family took a toll on the growers, and the Olympic faded into relative obscurity, but Raintree has brought it back for its exquisite flavor. Described as a startling sweetness and almost buttery richness that... Uh, just the necessary slight hint of tang. Productive cultivar cross between a phenomenal berry and a black cat raspberry. So this is another raspberry blackberry cross like the Marion berry. And in fact, the Marion berry is in my mind, in terms of its flavor, it really does taste like a cross between them both. But I get more of a raspberry flavor when I eat it but it looks just like a blackberry. So it's really quite incredible off the charts. If this one is as good as the others, the Marionberry, that's a win to me. Um, it's kind of similar also in that it's not that hardy here. So in a zone seven, a colder zone seven, you gotta be a little careful. You take them down off the trellis, you cover them just like the Marionberry with some uh, you know, leaves or mulch or whatever it is when they're on the ground and then in the spring you bring them up and put them back on the trellis um so certainly for me at least i think it's worth trying if it's as good as they say it is i sort of i'm on i'm on obviously i'm on the fence i have no idea but it's probably worth it uh at least to try the other perennial that i've been saying i'm going to grow for years is yacone and i've gotten them from different people different sources and they've never taken they've always died this is going to come in a pot so this thing is going to be definitely alive and hopefully if i can get it in a pot with some soil and plant it out in the spring it's going to be a guarantee that it'll live at least i hope so we'll we will see and uh i don't really have a great place for it either so i'm kind of like really wondering if I should plant it in my garden because that's actually what I decided to do, which we'll get to in a minute. But here's the, the spring garden over here and you cone smack dab in the, in the garden bed. And I probably, I really don't want to put it there. So if I can find a space for it somewhere else, I will, maybe I can put this actually back in between the apple trees and the grapes, or maybe even in the corner. I think definitely I'm going to move this thing. I don't know. But worst case scenario, I put it in the garden bed, and that's where it, it'll it'll hang out. Um, okay, so there's that. And, the, you know, the Yukon, by the way, for anyone that doesn't know, even though we've talked about it to death, is it's a lot like uh, sunchokes, if you have those before. It's a root crop. 
and people compare them to, I guess this actually is a really good comparison. It's like a cross between an apple, watermelon, and celery. I think that's pretty solid. They call them, uh, a lot of people refer to them as like a ground apple, I believe. I think that's a different type of, I think that's a name for them. Uh, but to me, they have a more uh, very sweet, crisp taste that really has a crunch to them. And for me, they're very easy to, I mean, I've heard and I've seen, obviously, they're very easy to grow. They just need a, a lot of sunlight, good location, um, and they'll, they'll just start to take off and they'll be there pretty much forever. And you can always multiply them very easily. It's a very good source of food that's extremely reliable. But for me, I think it's actually, it's quite, it should be quite tasty as well. Um, sunchokes I like, but um, I, I'm pretty sure, and I think a lot of people would agree that the Yacone, they actually like uh, like it better than the sunchokes. So I don't know. We'll see. I think this one's definitely worth trying, and I've been saying I'm going to try it for years. So got to do it, right? So that kind of brings us now, in a sense, to the garden plans, but we're going to leave that for the end. And there's a lot to cover because I made a lot of changes here. Um, what I would like to do now is really talk about the next sort of three months because we talked about the things I just attained. I just I was going to plant, whether they're in planting them in the ground or planting them in a pot, by the way, the Olympic berry is going to go right next to the Marion berries, just just to make it easy. Um, and it's not going to take up any more space than than necessary. So uh, it seems like a no-brainer to me. And, uh, you know, that way, again, I'm not having to dig anything up a year or two from now that I just planted. Um, I'd rather just probably order it or propagate it myself some point in the future uh, and then plant it then on, on the new property. So uh, let's talk about some other things. So grafting is definitely one form of propagation I want to talk about. So grafting is not going to take place um, really until the spring, right, right after bud break. I'm going to do a lot of grafting of persimmons this year. We have a couple, quite a few rootstocks are still left over that I've been kind of trying to get them to grow them out for a bit to get a, a larger caliper on the rootstock. Also, we're going to graft some figs. I have probably 30 rootstock of figs that I'm going to graft this year. A uh, couple different varieties, really not that diverse in terms of the varieties, but uh, just to try to get as many plants as I can of particular varieties. Things like uh, Rodino del Nord. Maybe I'll do a couple Ishia Blacks. Uh, Rosalino, I think I want at least another tree of that. Um, I have some interesting things that I just either just acquired or, um, again, more things I want to make more copies of. So, uh, that's kind of that. And again, we have to wait till bud break for that. Skipping quite a far ahead there, in fact, but that is at least going to happen roughly in the next three months. Cause right after bud break, usually around May 1st, we can start thinking about it. Maybe May 15th. Um, I think I said, did I say March 1st? I think I meant to say May 1st. So right around May 15th, we'll, we'll do most of our grafting, at least the first round of it. And that will be that. Um, I would like to do as well some grafting of some stone fruits, but I don't think uh, it's in the cards this year in terms of, um, you know, again, getting the orchard sort of not too crazy for when I move. Um, We'll do that kind of at a later date. So uh, other forms of propagation, the rooting that we're going to do. So I'm actually going to root, I think, this year a lot of gumi. I think because I don't have a whole lot of room. I don't have a whole lot of material left in terms of my fig trees. I would rather um, make use of that because I have a lot of room in the greenhouse, as some of you guys have seen and I've been talking about is I have tons of pots in here. So there's a lot of things that I can be doing in here in terms of seeding, um, in terms of rooting. And this is all where it's going to happen because, yeah, I do have the grow closet downstairs. Um, and I think that's probably where I will start fig cuttings in the future. But some of them are going to come out of that closet 
and out into this greenhouse. And that's where they're going to be sort of adjusted over time. Um, once they become a bit more established indoors to get them outside and continue that growing process before the season even really begins. I think that's going to be, um, I mean, a nice bonus, but actually kind of a negative because they, the plants might get too big, in fact, uh, for shipping, which is sort of what some of them really the purpose of them are is, uh, is for shipping. So uh, I don't know about that. We'll have to figure that out as we go, but um, certainly we're going to start them in, inside and then trans bring them outside when they become more established. But also I'm going to start probably in this greenhouse, the Gumi cuttings. And I know Gumi, we've talked about propagating it in the past, and actually it's one of my favorite fruits. Um, I would like to have more trees of it, more bushes of it, I should say. Problem is, it's difficult to air layer or even root. And I tried air layering it, and it it uh, it died. So I think uh, the branches I air layered on, or I did air layer, I probably went too deep in the cambium, and I should not have scored it too too deeply or too harshly. So if I'm going to air layer it, and these cuttings are not going to work out, going to try it again, but this time I'm not going to score the bark. In this greenhouse, when I start these cuttings of Gumi, definitely got to use rooting hormone. Hopefully can make this as easy as possible. I don't know how it's going to work out. It may, I may not have really good success at all, but I think it's worth a shot. Um, even if I can just get a couple plants, who knows? I think rooting hormone is probably the key because they are going to leaf out. Like that's That's pretty much a guarantee is that the, the cuttings will leaf out, but they, they definitely need some rooting hormone. Um, so in terms of propagation, that's mostly it. And, and the, the issue, though, is that in this greenhouse is that the cover is still on it, as you guys know. So if the cover's on it, how am I going to propagate anything in here? It's actually tonight it's supposed to be like 20 degrees outside and then 15 some other time this week. So it's, uh, you know... <laughs> it's quite difficult to grow anything or start any seeds or even have cuttings in here. I mean, everything in here is just dormant and I want to keep it that way. So normally when we, or when I, you know, get my head start of the season, it, it, it's usually around March 1st. And that will, that, that time of the year, usually there's enough day length and also it's getting warmer it's very unlikely at that point around March 1st, we'll see anything really below 20. Um, so it's a great, it's a great opportunity in my mind to make use of the very, very, very beginning of my season. And that includes season extension. So taking off the, the, the tarp off the greenhouse to let the light in, turn on the space heater in the greenhouse to make the greenhouse warmer, um, especially at night. Same thing with my low tunnels on my fig. So that's another thing we're going to do over the next three months is that March 1st, the low tunnels are going up. Uh, March 1st, this cover is coming off. So everything's going to be really awake and going only a month from now. It's kind of insane. We're almost in February. Um, it's amazing how quick this winter has gone by. It really is uh, kind of mind-blowing. I guess really a lot of it has to do with the you know, uh, the virus and COVID and all that really is in a sense, time has just flown by for me. I don't know about you guys, but it's really just flown by. Um, so that's what we're going to do. That's how it's all going to work. This is probably, um, my best bet. And I would, uh, you know, it's unfortunate cause I, I would like to actually start some seeds earlier than March 1st because March 1st at that point I could already plant some cool loving crops in the ground. I don't need to be waiting around, um, till April or May, you know, um, a lot of these things like onions, uh, some of the crops we're going to get to, we're going to talk about, I could plant them around March 1st. So ideally what you really want to do is even start the seeds in February 
start them February 1st or February 15th. And I'm still f- sort of flirting with that idea. It's just that it's so darn cold out. And the problem is the greenhouse is just so dry if you run that heater all day. So it's just going to be very difficult, I think, to sort of get every, the, the whole timings of everything perfect. But it's not going to be the end of the world. I'm not going to do any seating indoors this year. It's all going to be out here in this greenhouse. So I think either I'm going to make a decision to open it up February 1st or March 1st and just deal with it and have things just a little bit later than I would have. I think if I start my seeds roughly on March 1st and then I you know, plant the seeds or uh, get the seeds to a reasonable size by about March 15th. I think that's reasonable. Transplant them out March 15th. That's still a really good date. You know, some of the crops probably won't enjoy life um, around around uh, March 1st. So it's not the end of the world. It is sort of a bigger deal for things like onions, but I'm going to grow my onions at the community garden this year. So there's really no way around it unfortunately um by the way don't even have my onion seed so can't even do it um just with all these delays and things my package got sent to philadelphia the hub there and then it got sent all the way to like some other hub i don't know why it's like they really (laughs) philadelphia hub the united states postal service is a is a mess right now Anyway, so that's sort of the plans with the seeds and the cuttings and, you know, things are going well with with the cuttings, by the way. Um, I'm going to do an update on that soon on the YouTube channel. Uh, What else we got for you guys? So we talked about planting, propagating our plants for some uh, more citrus trees. And I think that's that is really roughly it. Um, in the next three months, I can't imagine much else that I have to do. It's really about the planning. It's really about preparing now, and I've done that, <clears throat> which is really what I want to get to now, I guess, in this episode of Fruit Talk is talk about the plants. They're almost, almost finalized. They're almost, almost there, and we've talked about them at numerous times now. And it's certainly evolved quite a bit since the last time we talked about it. So I'm not going to cover everything that we've already talked about. I am going to cover some of the changes, some of the new things. The community garden has changed quite a bit and for reasons I'll get into. So this was certainly a big change. And I think really, in a sense, I mean, without this planning process, I don't know. I don't really know what I would do. I really don't with this I don't think I'd have any success whatsoever or very little success Um, I wouldn't be able to grow nearly as much as I I am growing that's for sure so this is sort of a big deal for me and I just again I highly recommend that you guys try this out Uh, this is of course only our spring planting so this isn't even looking at the summer just yet it's not even really looking at the fall it's just in the spring so this is going to change again (laughs) uh at least two more three more times i mean uh i'm sure i'm going to change it even tomorrow so planning and careful consideration is definitely the key to this your uh your successful season here guys um so let's see here what is the uh i think we may have touched on this but the german butterball potato is really the potato we're going to grow and i've kind of gone into that potato i I really do think it's the best and we're going to grow it at the community garden and give it a lot of room i ordered quite a bit of them Um, i'm excited to see how they do at the community garden versus at my house and it's really hasn't been all that successful over the years also the planting date's going to be quite a bit later than normal so we'll see how that goes what the changes are I'm going to probably create myself a pretty big berm. That way they get more of that, uh, 
that room to kind of grow. I don't even know necessarily. I think they like uh, cooler soil temperatures. So I don't know if I really want to build a berm. You know, there's pretty there's some debate there. I really I really wonder what the most optimal soil temperature is for potatoes and their metabolism. And I know that uh, when things get too hot, they start to bolt, and that kind of ends their season. So I wonder really what what effects a, a raised bed has on potatoes. I don't know. It's a topic for another discuss another time. Um, some of the big changes here with the home garden is that we've added in some of our hot peppers. We have a habanero and a ghost pepper. We're going to grow those and mainly the reason for that is to make some hot sauce. Um, try that and see how it goes. We also added some uh, shishito peppers. Probably my favorite pepper to be honest with you. Um, we'll see how that goes. I've never grown them before but I really love them uh, when you grill them. They're really quite amazing. Uh, just enough of that heat to, for a lot of people to really love them, I think, is kind of the selling point there. And then, of course, your classic, standard, amazing Jimmy Nardello. Um, we also added the Purple Blush Tomatillo. This is one I just figured looked pretty good. Um, also, the Tomatillo is really the purpose there is for uh, salsa, as we've been making last summer. And it, that came out wonderful, and I just can't wait to make myself some salsa again, even with my own homegrown tomatillos this time. We've got uh, the eggplants. We mentioned those. Uh, struggling to find seeds, but I have a little bit left over, and I think my plants are kind of toast. Uh, we dug up the peppers and the eggplants, if you guys recall. I don't think they're going to make it just because it's been too cold in that greenhouse. Uh, on to the tomatoes. We've made some changes here. There's quite a few varieties. I decided I'm just going to try them out. Just said, the hell with it. Let's just see how they, they do. This one here I haven't found seed for yet. It's called Haley's Comet. Reminds me a lot of kind of like a black cherry, but probably quite different. And maybe this could you know, give black cherry a run for its money. I don't know. As uh, probably the best cherry tomato. Uh, the other cherry tomato I decided to add is is Blonde Kopchkin as we grew two years ago. Uh, 2000, I think it was the 2018 season. Um, no, 2019 season, I believe. I, I think it was 2008 on the video, 18 on the video, but I'm not sure. I think it's, I think it was only two years ago. Anyway, the point is, is that Blonde Kopchkin really impress me and I'm, we're, we're gonna see how that one do that one does um, in terms of getting them a large fruit production to also kind of dry uh, you know put set them aside and put them in the dehydrator because they have a great ability to hang on the vine and they also produce a ton of fruit so it could be in my mind really what I'm trying to do is really peg it against the Principe Varghese tomato. I think that's how you say it. This is the tomato we talked about in other episodes where it dries super well on the uh, on the vine and a lot of Italian growers use it for that purpose. And they sun dry their tomatoes and they're just incredible. There's a product that I really, really love that I've been eating a lot of. It's a sun dried tomato product in, in, uh, in oil and they're incredible. The amount of umami and richness in those tomatoes is like ridiculous. And I, if I were to guess, I would say they're probably Principe Borghese tomatoes. Um, so who knows? We'll find out. I What I want to do is actually do a whole row of them. And at the end of the season, you just take up the vines, turn them upside down, and you can hang them up in your house because they have an amazing drying ability. Now, is that going to be the case in my very humid Philadelphia area climate? I don't know, but we'll find out. Maybe I have to take them off and dehydrate them, and then that way they last all the way throughout the winter. I mean, that's it's still a win to me. I don't mind that. So for me, I think that's a big win to see if I can replicate that store-bought tomato product that I absolutely love that's in the olive oil. Uh, to me, it's just like... 
they're mind-blowingly good for that umami and richness it's just insane of course you can cook with them do all kinds of things with them i really miss tomatoes in the winter and it's it's been kind of sad you know i ordered i didn't order i i went to costco and bought myself a little box of little container of uh actually a larger container was like probably maybe even eight pints worth of tomatoes or something something big it's like either four or eight pints of tomatoes cherry tomatoes heirlooms and all you know probably f there was like four different varieties in there they looked pretty good um but they all sucked and actually i've been getting some cherry tomatoes from the grocery store by me and they actually sell a variety there that looks very similar and tastes very similar to black cherry so i figure wow that's interesting we'll buy those i actually been eating those and cooking with them they're really good they're actually not bad at all when you try to get into these other tomatoes that are cherries and cook with them they just suck they're really horrible at costco i feel like i wasted my money so what i did was i made them in the sauce and i i have some sauce that maybe i'll cook up one day make use of them but it just kind of goes to show you that you really need tomatoes i i've never even bought tomatoes in the in the winter time um over the last i don't know four or five years or so i've just been spoiled and i i they just are so inferior that i can't bring myself to eat them but those black cherries i think what they are at a local grocery store they're actually not bad i'm actually pretty darn surprised and uh and pleased with them so i don't know if uh if that's I mean, it is something I'm going to be able to find probably in the future, but I don't really want to have to rely on that. And also the quality of these Principe Borghese tomatoes, if you dry them and then you can preserve them in olive oil, I mean, they're just going to be superior. It's just like, it's a no brainer. The thing is though, that little jar that I buy is like five, six dollars. Yeah, they're incredible, but I want to be able to have like, and use as many of those tomatoes as I want. I use them very sparingly because they're five, six dollars, you know. Um, but I would probably eat those damn things like every day. They're just that good. So that was sort of a nice little revelation I've been having with more umami type foods like uh, um, anchovies. Love my anchovies now. We talked about that on Instagram. And then also the the sun dried tomatoes is just like it just you can add that either one of those two things to like almost anything and it just brings the flavor to another level it's so good um highly recommend you guys look into that either one of those two so um all right so that's the the tomato the prince of a borghese and that was a lot just on that one tomato uh the other ones we're going to grow is uh solar flare this one really seemed interesting i'm on uh, from Brad Gates Wild Boar Farms, I went through every single tomato he had. Well, not all of them, but most of them. And this one seemed to have a really good review or write up from Brad. So selected for flavor, wow factor, production, increased earliness, scab resistance, uh, very meaty. To me, it just seems like luscious sweet red tomato flavor i don't know this one just seemed to me interesting maybe i maybe i'm gonna regret it i don't know but i think it's worth trying i don't know something about it just caught my eye Pro probably just dead wrong actually on it but who knows he's got so many tomatoes it's hard to know which one's gonna really be the best tasting unless you just try them all and i don't know if he'll ever do that so anyway there's that tomato another one we want i want to try in uh to peg it against because th that was really the purpose of the solar flare is to see if i and to try to find something like pink brandywine or black crim or cherokee purple that would be better 
and compete. And the only thing I could find, well, there are some others that seem worthy of trialing, but this one, the the solar flares seem like it could be the best one for the to compete with those others. I don't know. Uh, there's also, by the way, by the way, before I get into the other tomatoes, the uh, Black Beauty tomato, and we've grown that again two years ago with that other video that we did, and that one was pretty good. I think I'm gonna try it again. Um, didn't get the production I really wanted out of it, so maybe it can impress me more than um, what I've seen. Also, the we're gonna try and grow Cherokee Purple again this year. Kind of over the black crim. I'm pretty convinced pink brandy wine is just better. And uh, I'll fight anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, the other two we got that are new is the Sweet Tooth and Bear's Tooth. And these are in competition with the Orange Banana. They are very interesting because they're those black, rich type tomatoes that you know, the darker colored, like the black creme, and they have a very good richness to them. Um, and because of that, Brad even says, good for fresh eating, plus the potential to make an amazingly rich sauce. So I'm all about finding a better tomato for a better sauce, but the orange banana is so hard to beat, I find. That sauce is, that I make is just incredible. Um, so we'll see. The bear's tooth could do it. Or the sweet tooth could do it. Seems like the sweet tooth is also rich, but on the sweeter side. So um, I don't know. They look interesting. They seem quite productive. Um, maybe, hopefully, uh, you know, not as difficult to grow, and can give me good production out of them. That's definitely quite important. Um, okay, so that really ends the tomatoes there. What I am going to talk about is these melons because we finally figured it out with the melons. And unfortunately, I'm going to save this talk for another time. I think it's just a lot to cover, so we're going to skip over that. There's so much more that's changed. Um, we're going to also grow the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts here at the, at the summer garden, taking out the onions because they didn't do well at all from sets we planted those in the fall and the, the critters and different things really got to them and they didn't do well at all um there's not even really many of them left oddly enough so i'm going to just make use of this space instead and i think broccoli and brussels sprouts really needs full sun needs more attention they're already so difficult to grow why make this more difficult for myself if i can just grow them in a better spot it stinks to have to give up some of my summer garden some of my prime garden location but i think it's worth it they're honestly my favorite vegetables so i've been eating broccoli and brussels sprouts every day for like the last three months so uh yeah they're incredible even more incredible when you get them from your garden i mean it's actually insane how good they are uh all right now that brings us here to this the spring garden here and then we have to go all the way to the community garden so there's still still a bit more to cover we got things like here like spinach we put the strawberry bed in by the way this will be mara de bois this is taking up now some of our garden space we also have arugula radish cilantro i think the arugula what i realized what's worth sharing is that you can actually make a pesto out of it i had no idea i don't know why it never dawned on me I think an arugula pesto would be amazing. And I grow arugula like a champ. Spinach, I want to eat spinach more. And I want to try to eat that like every day if I can. So we have a lot of spinach that I'm going to grow. That's a pretty good area right there. And we'll see if I can do it. I don't know. I may need even more, more space to be honest with you. Uh, we're also going to grow fennel. I love myself fennel. If I can get a number of bulbs throughout the year, uh, cut them back about once or twice throughout the season and have multiple bu multiple bulbs coming up from the base. Originally, you cut the main plant, you cut that bulb off, and then they re-sprout, and it sends up a couple bulbs later in the season, and you actually get two harvests two different times of the year. And they're really incredible. 
uh, for the amount of food that they put out. It's insane. Um, although this is a shadier spot, so it might not work out in my favor, but regardless, I think fennel is a good thing to have in the garden um, no matter what. Now, we're going to do the carrots, of course, the mochum carrot. We get the French breakfast radish. Um, the cucumbers, by the way, back to the summer garden. We talked about those in an earlier episode. Uh, the spinach is the Bloomsdale long standing spinach. And then we're going to do the sugar snap peas. The sugar snap peas, by the way, is the sugar and variety. Grow them every year. Love them. Honestly, my favorite snack in the garden. Um, it's really an amazing time when I have strawberries and snap peas to eat. They're so sweet, so amazing. Makes garden work a lot easier. Uh, more arugula. And then we have some of these new things here, which I want to talk about, which some of you might be looking at and saying, what is that? Um, these are kind of the newest things that I've been, I found really just last night, just through some research. One here is called uh, Cavolo, Cavolo Broccolo Spigariello Franchi. And Franchi, I think, is the uh, – that's the nursery name. This one, they could also go by the name Freiaratelli, Freiarelli or Broccoletti. I'm going to call it Broccoletti. I don't know what to call this thing. I don't know Italian. I'm only 15%, guys. Okay? I just did a DNA test. I'll hand in my Italian card later, okay? I don't know who to give it to, though. You know, maybe there's some uh, some mafia member or something in the Northeast I, I have to go to and file some paperwork or something. <coughs> I don't know. Talking for long periods of time is difficult. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So the, the broccoletti is very interesting to me because it's like a it's like a flowering headed broccoli. It says sweeter broccoli flavor. Um, it says used traditionally on pizza, olives, and chili in pasta dishes or boiled sauteed and served as a, a side dish. Um it seems like to me a very interesting vegetable. I mean, I really like broccoli and I really like broccoli rob. So this is kind of in a sense similar. Um, if you look this up, just to get some photos of it, it probably would help. And there's different varieties of it. So some of them are for like, like this, as you can see here, is kind of like very thin broccoli, almost like a, a, a broccoli rob or a, a Chinese broccoli like Kai Lan um, or like Suho, something along that of that effect. There's other varieties of this, and here's actually, I think, what the plants look like. So I think they either branch out and you just keep picking the heads or you can just harvest them at the base. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. I've never grown them. So I really can't tell you a whole lot, but it looks like there's a lot of side shoots and you can obviously harvest the side shoots. So I think it's mainly for side shoot production or you harvest them at the base and you get them with the leaves and the leaves are pretty good. Now there's some of them like this one here, which is how this gets a bit confusing because this one here is similar again it's a broccoli plant but you mainly eat it for the main shoot here that pops up but really you eat it for these leaves it's a small obviously that's a small seed head there but these leaves are really like broccoli leaves almost like kale in a sense and that's how they're they're normally eaten is you eat them as like kale so the this photo right here where it's just like the leaves and even this one here where you can see a lot of leaves that's kind of what you're going to get and for me that is amazing i mean i don't know about you but that seems like it's going to taste so good 
Um, this one says, the more you cut, the more it grows. Eat the leaves and the little broccoli tops. Yada, yada, yada. It's got a lot of nice, looks like it's got a nice texture to it. It could probably pick up a lot of flavor when you saute it. It just looks so good. I just hope it's not very tough. You may have to, I guess, take out the stems if they're too tough. Maybe it's too much fiber. I don't know. The next one here is a, a, a mustard, and this one is used like broccoli rob. So for me, I think that's really interesting. You just harvest these leaves, and it's a mustard. Mustards are easy to grow, super easy to grow. So having a broccoli rob, in a sense, that's easy to grow, all good. Especially you can get this one in the spring, I imagine, because it's a mustard. I don't see why you wouldn't be able to start it in the spring. Whereas bro broccoli rob and some of these brassicas um, really are dependent on the time of the year. You know, the Japanese, the Chi the, uh, the suho, the, the uh, Chinese broccoli and all that. It really is time sensitive, the year. And a lot of those vegetables from Asia uh actually prefer to grow in warmer temperatures or um, you have to plant them in the in the summer to harvest them by the fall and then the last thing here I think is actually the best of the whole thing which is uh, Sima de Rapa Quarantina so this is apparently a type of turnip so this is a turnip that they that you plant I don't even know if it forms a bulb, but the top of the turnip forms something like broccoli rap. You know, I think that's why it has rapa in the name. Um, this one just seems unbelievably good. And they have different, by the way, different varieties here um, on this website, Seeds of Italy, that I, I'm looking at this on. And it's Sima di Rapa, and they have different varieties. They do different things, ripen at different times. Um, but they're all, I think, turnips. And the, you eat the tops of the turnips. Now, turnips are extremely easy to grow here. So if that's what's happening, this should be an easy, easy win. And I'll be able to harvest these tops and be able to have something that's really, really good. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. They look so good. I mean, it looks like a, a head of broccoli in a sense, but it's it's not. It's a turnip. Interesting. I don't even know. Maybe it's not a turnip. Maybe the website's just wrong. I don't know. Yeah, here it is. It says here, it's a Sema is a plant in the turnip family that produces edible leaves. 12 to 14 inch uh, stem of the broccoli like head okay so it doesn't produce a bulb at the bottom but if it is in the f turnip family it should be easy to grow and you could do this in the spring summer and fall I've read that you can do this quite early um, good with orichetti I imagine it is it's yeah it sounds amazing so I'm in and I'm growing a lot of this this is probably the one that gets it's getting the most space out of all of them and uh, so here's the mustard the turnip one and then here's the the broccoli plants that are either for the leaves or for the shoots whatever it is and then once the spring ends these beans are gonna go up in this section here so they're going to go right up because all this is going to come out at a certain time when it just gets too warm and then you can plant the beans and then the beans will be in there once the beans are done then I do this whole thing all over again and plant something like this in its in its spot after the beans may not be enough time to be perfectly honest with you to get three crops in but if I do it right and I got good fertility, it might work out. All right, so then that covers my yard.
the community garden is what le- what's left, and there's not a whole lot of difference here. We have the tomatoes. We have the uh, Italian onion that I decided to go with. It's a red onion. We have the German butterball potato. We've got runner beans and also borlotti beans. The borlotti is something that I thought was rather interesting. And I've been trying to look for them and find them. I've heard about them a lot, actually, from Charles Dowding. And the plants look very easy to grow. And I've, I've grown runner beans in, the, in a prior year. They're actually rather difficult in the summer heat. They don't seem to set their pods. Uh, and then if they don't set their pods, you don't get any beans. And you can't have them for dried beans. The Borlotti beans should be a bit more reliable, I imagine. At least I hope. And you can either get the beans to cook them f- fresh and green, or you can have them for dried purposes. And that's actually what I would rather prefer to do and probably will do, is I'm really gonna try to focus on getting some dried beans this year to have in the winter. Um, so things like my noodle beans. Um, I also have quite a few uh, think like climbing beans that we're gonna put all over the edges of the community garden along the fence. And actually, I. Th- pretty sure I have a few varieties. I don't know what they're called. I forget, but um, there's a yard long bean. I think my friend Pete sent me um, kind of just beans that climb all up and down. We'll just see what they do. See how they do. Just put beans in every which way that we can. You can even put beans along the corn like a three sister style, but I'm not sure I'm going to do that this year. I do have the squash around the around the corn so we will see I guess if um, if this can all work out I'm sure it will I probably should just put in the the beans but it's not really a necessity you know I think what what really is gonna how this is all gonna work like I've said before and how it worked for me actually last year at home was that the corn gets harvested and then these squash plants just take over the whole area. And by the time the winter squash comes in, uh, they're the only thing left in the garden and then you're done. You just harvest all your squash, call it a day, cure them, you know. That's all it is. So they just take up this whole space, whereas they kind of start out a little bit slower, don't need a whole lot of space. And then by the time the potatoes, onions and the corn is done, the squash is just ready to go. You know, it's just basically that. And these borlotti beans will be there all year. The tomatoes will be there all year. Uh, The different types of squash I'm going to grow is the kabocha we've talked about, the butternut we've talked about, the sweet dumplings, spaghetti squash, and then finally the uh, trombacino, which we talked about in a recent episode of Fruit Talk, how that one is better zucchini when eaten green, but then if you let it cure and mature, it actually turns into something that's quite good, like a butternut, and they store well. So multi-purpose squash right there, the Trombocino. Excited to try it. Uh, The other weird thing I found here was something called a Gretti, and I think I've actually talked about this in a prior episode of Fruit Talk, and I thought, wow, this would be interesting to grow. And I'm gonna. I bought some seed, so we are gonna try it. We're gonna see. It's uh, says right here. It's uh, an annual with long chive-like foliage, very popular in Italy. Become the latest trend in high-end Italian restaurants. Fifty days to maturity. It's a warm season crop. I think I read. Um, it's a bush. It the the flavor is a bit bitter, a bit sour. You braise them in olive oil and garlic, and you serve them as a side dish. Uh, kind of like maybe you would do like uh, some dandelion greens on the side. This is sort of the deal here. Um, so I'm interested to see what this does. It seems very easy to grow. The plants seem nice and healthy. Um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Might be a bit tough. Maybe I cut the tops off. Uh, kind of looks like asparagus to me rather than chives yeah anyway very interesting there then we've also got a couple tomatoes and melons I've been thinking about this is called the black seaman tomato 
again, could replace potentially Pink Brandywine. You know, that's really what I wanted to do was pin Pink Brandywine against other beefsteaks and see how it does. It's just so darn good. I think I, I really do like the production on it, especially given enough space. Um, Black Beauty, we'll see. I mean, I've already tasted it. I don't even know if I should grow it again. Be totally truthful. Cherokee Purple, I think, is worth another shot. And Solar Flare, who knows? Who the heck knows? Um, so this one could be a, a decent contender. I don't know. I, this one came highly recommended. I know that a lot of people like these types of tomatoes that are dark, rich. Um, people have all kinds of recommendations, like Black from Tula, Japanese Trifel, um, Paul Robeson. I mean, they're just the list goes on and on and on. And I personally, unless there was super convincing evidence that something was better than pink brandywine, I just am very reluctant to even try it. You know, people always, it's so strange. People always have it. I could, if any of you comment below, someone's going to say, I like this tomato or I like this tomato. Or, I like this tomato. It's never a general consensus of this is the best one and it's better than pink brandywine. I haven't found that to be true just yet. So if there's one of them, you know, and I've, I've heard of it, I'm sure. If you guys mention the name, I'm sure I've even heard of it. So even if I went to Baker Creek, Heirloom Seeds, and we'll go down to the uh, tomato section. Purple tomato section. Here's the Black Beauty. Black Crim, obviously. Here's Paul Robeson. Cherokee Purple. There's the Carbon. The carbon Copy, I think it's called. What is this? That looks interesting. Black Brandywine. Hmm. S Violet Jasper. Okay. There's so many more. This doesn't even do it. Doesn't even do it justice. Uh, what's the website? Um, seed savers. Doesn't even come close to doing this discussion justice. So that's sort of what I'm getting at here. Is that I think I'm going to do this. Finish this off with these little last thoughts here. Like here's black from Tula. Here's Black Seaman. Um, obviously, there's Pink Brandywine, which is really different than these purple black tomatoes, I think. It's it's really a pink tomato. It's not really black. And I think, or purple, um, it's lighter in color for sure. Black Trifel. You know... Even on Brad Gates' website, he has a ton of these black, purple tomatoes that I don't know anything about. This is another one. Here's Paul Robeson. I mean, they all sort of are just the same thing, if you ask me. Um, slightly different with absolutely no indication of which one's the best I think there's a uh, Russian one that people really like too what's the name of that one this is an interesting tomato you can't Ukrainian purple so this is another plum tomato Hmm. Didn't say anything about sauce, so I don't know. These Ukrainian and purple and Russian tomatoes. I don't get it. Man, it's crazy how dark that is. This to me when I tasted it really did taste like fennel. 
It wasn't the best tomato I ever had. This person said, literally the best tomato I've tasted. It was quite earthy, tasted like fennel, had a nice flavor. Black brandy wine. I wonder how good this is. Yeah, so I'm going to have to look into this and see if there is any ones I want to try. Because, you know, the list of melons I'm going to try is pretty insane. And I just kind of feel like might as well do a similar thing with tomatoes this year. Get a little, you know, crazy, a little, a little uh, creative with this, and um, you know, see what comes up. So that I think is kind of it here for this episode of Fruit Talk, guys. I do appreciate everybody sticking around. If you got to this point, um, please leave a review on iTunes or something, or hit the subscribe button. Um, Whatever you guys think in some way, you guys think you could support me, I'd appreciate it. Um, even just coming back next week and watching the, the episode. All right, so we will see you guys soon. I'll see you guys next week. I hope everybody's staying safe, happy, and healthy. And, uh, yeah, take care, guys.